Welcome, everyone, to another episode of the Stray Pixels podcast, where just to let you guys know ahead of time, we will not be premiering a new trailer for God of War Ragnarok. Uh, there will not be a release date here. There are actually other video games coming out in the near future. Uh, I know it's hard to believe for some people. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I am your host. Uh, I am Noise Pixel staff writer Colin Buchanan, and I am joined, as usual, by my co-host, uh, staff writer Nathan Mejia, and our guest host, uh, our editor-in-chief, uh bailey c mangle how are you doing <laughs> oh, well, man. it's been a while it has yeah. been a while we are we are super happy to have you back for for a week um and i asked you specifically because the three of us all watched the state of play together yep uh and so last time we talked about the state of play it was like oh well you know they measured expectations so we knew what to what to look out for and this was pretty it was pretty good this was good like this was a huge presentation. This is like, aside from that thing about God of War, which they they warned people ahead of time about. Like this is everything we conceivably could have asked for. I think. There's a lot of shit here. Yeah. <laughs> so, what were you guys expecting going into this? Besides, you know, not seeing the release date for for Ragnarok yet. Mm -hmm. Um, I guess I'll go first, but honestly, whenever I go into these, I try not to expect anything uh, because I, I've had a general experience is that when I go in with, I want to be surprised, I don't want anything, I always come out having a good time. So I've never had a lack, especially lackluster one of these shows, except for when they're showing back to back, back to back stuff I don't care about. <laughs> Or uh, Dragon Quest merch that will be unavailable outside of Japan in the worldwide broadcast. Yes. I'm going to die mad about that live stream. Or, <laughs> or it's uh, Guardians of the Galaxy for half an hour. <laughs> hey, that turned out okay. <laughs> how, about, how about you, Bailey? What were you expecting to see? I mean, I, I think, like, to me, I was expecting 16 and we got that because, like, they said that the trailer was done for a while and... Mm -hmm. There was already some president because they sh because the game got announced during a state of play. So I was like, I mean, I feel like it's probably about time now, you know? Yeah. Sure. And I mean, they did say there will be more information shared in the spring, and we are swiftly running out of spring. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, it, this was an if not now when uh, type deal. And it was, of course, uh, announced for next year, which is not what everybody thought was going to happen. But you know what? We'll get to it because we started with uh, a thing that we all knew was inevitably eventually coming, uh, the Resident Evil 4 remake. <laughs> Man. So if I can, if I can like get my thoughts out on this first. Um, sure. <laughs> I, I, don't, I, <laughs> I don't really know why i was so hardcore for this game doesn't need a remake just leave it alone um because i feel that way much more strongly about the following game uh and not because it's perfect because i want no one to ever acknowledge its existence ever again uh but with resident evil 4 like yes it still feels pretty okay to play uh I, I maintain that the Wii version is probably the definitive version of the game. Um, but at the same time, like as long as they they understand that like we love this game because it's a goofy camp masterpiece in a lot of places, mm -hmm. that I don't know, if they can maintain even a little bit of that tone, I think people will be happy as long as they don't go completely like straight faced with it. And the idea of you know a reimagining of the story sounded really cool to me. Like they, sh the first thing that we saw was playable Ashley, and that's you know that's interesting. I want to I want to see you know how exactly she got into the situation and what she was doing before she got rescued. And there's there's a lot of ground that could be covered there. So Nate, you you have opinions. I have opinions. <laughs> um, I am I am distinctly in the camp of this game doesn't need a remake uh same with five oh. and, and i would i would argue six needs a remake more than four the six remake i'm hyped for actually uh, and, and i would say i would actually be disappointed if they if they skip five i don't care that is quote unquote racist that that is the best it's it, it is not quote it is unambiguously <laughs> racist it's what so you, racist what do you oh want to be in africa not killing people 
Now you gotta watch it. <laughs> I want them to not them. be just literally just scary tribal black men. You know? <laughs> That's not till area two. <laughs> you're not you're not making a good point here <laughs> you're making whatever the opposite of a point <laughs> the first area is not not fucking like no. racist but the, the it's second still one, though? pretty bad <laughs> it i it i i would maintain it's not because it's not going in with the attention of hey this is what we think hey you no, know it's hey, it's japan it's just really culturally insensitive yeah that's it just <laughs> they don't they don't know what they're doing but that doesn't make it not racist <laughs> um but i i would highly maintain there are definitely other games that need this remake more than four four holds up the best and i would even argue i think four is overhyped um, and they are definitely going to RE2, RE3 this. They're, we're, we're, we are going to get a more classic look into Resident Evil where it's going to be scary. More, more so than the action bombastic that RE4 was. Well, I mean, I kind of, like... <laughs> they kind of took the, the action-heavy element of it, like quite significantly further to the detriment and death of the series when when re6 came around because yeah. like at, by that point i feel like they had completely abandoned the horror side of things and that was why resident evil 7 was so much more just a simple straight up un unambiguous horror game mm -hmm. um so i don't know i think that like they know that there's things that people like about the modern resident evil games like specifically seven and eight and if they can give us more of that in four i think that it will be received well yeah but it'll it'll i think it'll be fine i'm not gonna sit here and say it's gonna be a bad game because it's not i mean the good news is that like resident evil 4 has been ported to every platform known to man or alien so <laughs> it's still going to be right there if you want to go back and so play it, it. it it's not even that the thing i think it's it's more so that it is so readily available you know i i could play oh. re4 right now on my switch on my phone on <laughs> my xbox on my computer on, on everything <laughs> why can't i play co why can't we get a mm -hmm. code veronica remake you can you can play code veronica as a ps4 remake yeah remaster. but you even said code veronica is bad it is bad. How does that how does that relate to me saying that you can go play it right now if you want to? It's on PS3. You can go download it right the hell now. <laughs> oh man. I would much rather have it remade. Oh my gosh. One day, man. Bailey, before we move on, how do you feel about Resident Evil 4 remake? So like four is the only one I played, so I'm kind of excited. <laughs> um like like I think four is the one horror game i played because i like scare really easily or like i i just didn't like give a shit about like like about any atmosphere um i am really like interested in it because it felt like because i i i do kind of want to see it be kind of serious like um sort of and just see how that goes because like i think they kind of were funny in the original for the sake of being funny because I think it, I think it was pretty like I because I think their their like humor was pretty intentional in the old game. Sure, sure, yeah. but like also, I feel like the campier elements of the original, the original three games, a lot of it was accidental because a lot of it was because of poor localization quality. Mm, yeah, some of it, yeah. I am the master of unlocking. <laughs> no. I feel like that had to be fucking intentional, right? So it, it was intentional to a degree, not for B thing, but because the, the director was Japanese and he thought that style of talking was cool. Yep. Yep. That's camp. Cool, that is failed seriousness. That is what yep. camp is. That is pretty cool, though. <laughs> Stop. Don't open that door. It's <laughs> like it's like <laughs> Yu Suzuki casting the voice actors by, for Shenmue based on which voice actors look the most like the character. <laughs> Which you say that, but Silent Hill 2 did that. <laughs> and look where it got them into a stupid lawsuit. <laughs> what, because Guy, see, he wanted to get paid again like he should have? I'm sorry, <laughs> Troy Baker. That's not how it. this works, man. <laughs> anyway, 
anyway, we're gonna kind of uh, <laughs> highlight real uh, the the PSVR two stuff because I don't know how how excited any of us necessarily are yet for it until we actually like have the thing in our hands and know how it feels. Yeah. Um. So we got uh. PSVR 2 support for Resident Evil Village, which is pretty expected because Resident Evil 7 was the killer app for the original PSVR headset. They also, um, they also announced um, VR support for 4 Remake as well. True. Yeah. Um, we got confirmation that the Walking Dead Saints and Sinners Chapter 2 is coming to PSVR 2, which was pretty expected because, again, the first game was on PSVR 1, and we already knew the sequel was happening, so why wouldn't it? Mm -hmm. Um. No Man's Sky is also getting support for PSVR 2. Again, it's on the first headset. We kind of expected that they would make a jump because they are still actively developing for the game. Uh, we got a trailer for Horizon Call of the Mountain, which was already announced, but it was nice to see like a little bit more of what this game is going to be like. Yeah. Uh, and that was that was sort of the big PSVR 2 showcase. They they pretty wisely condensed all of that down uh, into like a couple minutes, so it didn't eat up the majority of the of the presentation because obviously like PSVR's install base is you know not even 10 percent of of the ps4's install base let alone yeah. what we're going to see when the second generation headset ships and i'm sure it's going to be just as hard to find as the console it's made for yeah. uh so <laughs> that's gonna suck but uh the next big thing that we got was marvel spider-man remastered for pc uh and i have one opinion on this that i tweeted uh, it's great that this is happening, but it's really irritating that it's going to be easier to buy on PC than on the console it was originally developed for. Mm -hmm. Because you can't buy Marvel Spider-Man Remastered by itself. You have to buy it oh, in yeah, the Miles Morales mm -hmm. bundle. Yep. yep, That's really fucking weird. So, any I, either of you have anything to say about this PC release other than, you know, cool? <laughs> yeah, it's cool. Yeah, I mean, it's cool. It's kind of weird that we're getting it like this. Uh, I'm not going to say because it devalues exclusives, but it makes exclusives make less sense, rather. I th I think it's been long enough where it's like, you know, why not just True. make it more available, you know? So, with, with the, so we also got a confirmation that Miles Morales is coming to PC later. Um, yeah. But... We also uh, have started to see rumors going around that uh, Sackboy and Returnal are also getting PC ports relatively soon. Yeah. Neither Ooh. of those were huge blockbuster exclusives, but it does seem like the strategy of just waiting a couple years has been working out for them. And I don't necessarily think that this takes away from the exclusivity because I feel like PC is sort of the neutral ground in the yeah. in the console wars. I'm kind of surprised they're doing Sackboy because that's like their like pseudo mascot. Yeah, like, yeah. kind of. I, th I feel like Astro has more or less taken mm. Sackboy's place as, as like a PlayStation mascot. Um, yeah, maybe. Because like, you know, are we even getting a little big planet four? Like, like we Ooh. still have no idea what's going on with that. Media Molecule's still doing their own thing. Yeah. Um, we don't know what Sumo Digital is, is working on right now. Um, so, you know, they're, they're, they're seeing huge success in sales on the ports that they've already released. And if that's what it takes to keep these, you know, single player experiences coming, I'm totally down for that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Let the PC people eat, okay. uh, especially if it's going to continue to be really hard to find an actual console. Yeah. Um, the next big news was Stray finally has a release date, and even better, it is coming day and date to PS Plus Extra Premium and Deluxe. Yeah. Uh, hype. Uh, Stray Stray is, is something that I've been waiting literally years to find out more about uh, since, since they announced it at the PlayStation 5 Showcase. And the fact that it's coming soon, like really soon, like in six weeks, and is it like uh, Bugsnax and Destruction All Stars and Oddworld Soulstorm is launching for free through a subscription service? Mm -hmm. This is cool. This is exactly what I want to see. If they're not willing to ship their like huge AAA games, is you know these middle cards and indie games finding a home on these services? I'm totally down for that. How do you yeah. guys feel? I mean, I feel it's fine because Bugsnax was like a ps5 launch ps plus game and, and that was a real enjoyable time like surprisingly so 
Um, so I think it makes a little sense that those are on it. And I think uh, PlayStation has been doing a lot of push for indie games. And that was really indicative of that, of this state of play too. Um, that they, they're giving some indie titles that I that normally would never hear about play. So I think it makes sense a hundred percent for them to do this. And I'm uh, pretty excited to, to see what other games are going to be on the list. Bailey, how about you? I, I feel like Stray is one of those games where people aren't going to really try it unless they have the service, you know, like the convenience mm -hmm. of it is going to make it a lot more playable, I think. Mm -hmm. So that's pretty we'll, cool. We'll see. I feel like Stray has been like kind of a sleeper hit in the making for a while because mm -hmm. I feel like it's one mm -hmm. of those games that people are just have just consistently been interested in finding out more about. Like there's just been a, a groundswell ever since it got announced of people that are like, What's the deal with this cyberpunk cat game? When's it coming? What do we do in it? How, like, like, how is it gonna? How is it gonna play? Um, and that that's never gone away in the entire time since it got announced. So I'm hoping it does well. I'm hoping mm -hmm. that uh, launching on the subscription service works out for them. Um, mm -hmm. So nothing but the best for for Stray. Um, yep. Do any of us care enough to talk about Callisto Protocol? Um, <laughs> I, I mean, it, it's cool. Uh, I'm kind of excited for it because it is by the maker of Dead Space, which is yeah, why. Can you tell? It's, it's yeah. Can you tell by looking game. at that trailer that it's from the maker of Dead Space? Well, yeah, cause, because I mean, the internet is going to forever refer to it as not Dead Space. Well, yeah, <laughs> it, it is in my eyes spiritual successor, and I'm kind of excited for it more than the Dead Space remake because, again, uh, I feel like Dead Space 1 was really, really good. If anything needs a remake, it's Dead Space 3. Um, but yeah, th that's all I have to say about Callisto Protocol. I'll probably pick it up or review it whenever it comes by. Um, we got Roller Dome, which is a neat looking little, you know, roller yeah. blade game. Um, I don't know. I don't like the art style to me. This is, this is going to be one of those that we're going to have to wait and see, um, yeah. and see if it feels, you know, more fun than it looks. Cause unfortunately the art style just doesn't look interesting. Like yeah. it's it's very stylized, but it's also very bland at the same time. It, it kind of looks like what I would consider a web comic art style almost. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? I feel Where that. It, it looks kind of distinct, but if you've read web comics enough, it kind of blends in with other ones. Um so the next game was Eternites. This was this was a weird one. Um, hey. Bailey, Bailey, how are we feeling about Eternites? Do you have the do you have the context for for what's going on here? Eternites is like I don't I don't know why people always associate me with this fucking game, but um, I don't, so like there's so yeah, so I, I like work all this shit. So the plot is like um, there's like this weird like creature that has caused a virus in humanity and they become like monsters or something mm -hmm. um and the protagonist and like um um some of these girls are like trying to help find a, they're like trying to help find a cure for it um and it's like tagged as a dating action game so you could date the girls that should happen so, um <laughs> And that's kind of all the story we have so far. Handshakers. Yeah. It's handshakers. <laughs> See, even though you say that, my first joke was, yo, Persona 6? <laughs> no, it didn't It didn't look like Persona 6 to me. I, like... Can you imagine? It, it's got a very obvious influence, <laughs> but it's also not nearly as stylized as I would expect uh, yeah, like, Persona so to be. The creator mm -hmm. of this game, I'm not sure if you guys seen him on Twitter. Um, uh, yeah, no, we, we saw the... the yeah, he was like, "Hey, I played Persona Four, and it made me want to make a video game." Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Like, oh. <laughs> so that was kind of adorable. Uh, it's really cool that that this is getting uh, like the full the full scale of releases. This is coming to PS4, Five, and PC on Steam and Epic Game Store. So you don't have to bitch about it either way. <laughs> yeah, everyone yeah. gets to play wherever they want to, unless you're on Xbox, because fuck Xbox. <laughs> I guess and no switch <laughs> and no, no switch. switch but like <laughs> let's be real this doesn't this doesn't look like one of those games that would work well on on switch yeah, if it's being made not. for yeah um I so I I ma mainly focused on Bailey there because I feel like Nate is going to have a lot to say about <laughs> our next title which is Street Fighter 6 uh, 
This was not the announcement for Street Fighter Six, but this was our first major look at it, and it yeah. looks wonderful. Yeah, it, it it was our first major gameplay look, and even just kind of like a a release window. So it was like a big info dump. Uh, the big thing to look out for is, I saw that they like in the beginning there's looks like it's going to be a hub world we can explore with a more expanded story mode, which I'm excited about. Uh, yeah, didn't they like de-emphasize the story mode a lot in Street Fighter Five, if I remember correctly? Yes, it didn't even launch with story mode. Mm -hmm. with Street yeah, Fighter Five. That was a later thing they added. Yeah. yeah. So I think you had like classic mode and then versus, and that was it. And the fighting felt okay, but everything looks much more stylized in, in six, more so than five. And I'm sure everybody's excited about um, Hot Ryu. And, uh, and happy pride, everyone. <laughs> and she took the kids' Ken. <laughs> oh, yeah. So, like, there's been this like massive leak. I'm not yeah. sure if we're going to. It, it's all this, true. It's kind uh, of nuts. Yeah. Yeah. Cap Capcom they, they did say it's true. true. Yeah. 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 Yeah, the whole roster leaked already. We got videos, um, mm -hmm. which you know what? Good, good for Capcom for just like owning up to it and not trying to yeah. bury it or ignore it. Mm -hmm. uh, this, this was this was a good time to be a Capcom fan. Fan yeah. this this state of play. Y'all, uh, yeah. y'all ate. Um, except where is Ace Attorney Seven? Huh? Where's, 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 the, where's the new Mega Man? <laughs> where's the new Mega Man? Ace Attorney Seven has been rumored for fucking years where so, like, is it th there's so during i think in that nvidia leak or something mm -hmm. i think there was ace attorney on there i believe I feel like that was? was chronicles though i thought that that was great that, mm. that was where we got the first inkling that great ace attorney was actually and that was the thing that made everybody think that the leak wasn't true was that because like be great ace attorney was never getting localized right like that was never yeah, in a yeah. million years gonna happen <laughs> yeah um Anyway, so we got we got a PS4 and PS5 launch for Tunic, which has been you know blowing up the internet for the last month and a half. Uh, yeah. So happy for that. Um, we got a look at Season: A Letter to the Future, uh, which looks really neat. Aside from the fact that the studio is already uh, facing mm. accusations of of uh, sexual yep. harassment and bullying in the workplace culture. Yep. Uh, I'm exhausted. Yeah, I'm so poor, tired. Poor Semi, man. He was like, I was so excited. For, I'm so excited for this game. I want to review it. Then to straight, oh man. Yep. Yep. <laughs> yep. And finally, uh, the the moment everyone was waiting for, uh, and has been waiting for for the last several uh, events, uh, we got a gameplay trailer for Final Fantasy 16 mm -hmm. uh and a release window. Um so we're going to start we're going to start with this simple one which is the release window. Uh a lot of people thought that this game was coming this year uh but they had also already announced beforehand that the game had been internally delayed because of issues working on it during COVID. Yeah. Uh frankly, I think it's a miracle that it looks as good as it does considering both that and the continued development by this same staff of Final Fantasy 14. Uh, you know, I gave N Walker a 10 out of 10, uh, and they're still, you know, this 16 is coming out summer 2023, which is probably going to be about five months before the next Final Fantasy 14 expansion comes out. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if, if this comes out quality, full props to the third, to the third development team yeah. <laughs> at Square Enix, because damn, um, the, yeah. the joke that I saw was they announced summer 2023 because we all know that it would have been delayed if they'd announced it for November of this year. So yeah. they just went ahead and did that, did that ahead of time. <laughs> yeah. I'm actually still surprised it's coming out next year. Like this feels like really early from announcement to release of a Final Fantasy game. I mean, I think they just, they learned their lesson from uh, Kingdom Hearts 3 because... I think, I think Yoshi P said that he wanted to wait until... They added like enough to show or something like yeah. they, like they were more yeah. confident in it. Yeah. Um. Because Square Enix now has two of the most famous cases of games that were announced way too fucking early because they they announced uh, KH three and Final Fantasy seven remake long before either of them had entered full development. Uh. And that obviously was something of a mistake because it made them a laughing stock about it for literally years. <laughs> so, I think that this you know having having announced it that was announced during the ps5 showcase right am i am i crazy i'm pretty sure that that was when if not yeah, if not yeah. the ps5 showcase yeah. then it was the dual sense showcase when they announced um, the ps5 yeah 
Mm -hmm. So it is still a pretty significant like stretch of time, but they didn't know that COVID-19 was going to knock their entire, you know, not yeah. knock their entire development cycle into question. Uh, so maybe we, we would have already had it by now, if not for that. And that would have also been pretty impressive, but I'm fine with summer 2023, as long as it doesn't mean that uh, FF7 R part two and kingdom hearts four aren't that much further away because the last thing that I want is for those to come out. And we're already like two thirds of the way through this console cycle. <laughs> well, it's like a different mm -hmm. development team for them. You know, like it's not going to really be impacted. Yeah. True, but it's also square. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. But anyway, God, this game looks so good. Um, the yeah. the big thing that the internet has been talking about, aside from uh, the obvious uh, Soken coming back and doing the music and and blowing everybody away already before the game is even out, with with how amazing it sounds, um, was the combat director. Uh, the combat director for Final Fantasy 16 previously worked on Devil May Cry 5. Mm -hmm. So that should tell you what we're in for here. <laughs> How do you guys feel about, about the much more heavy emphasis on single, uh, single party member action here? I feel like that's kind of where it was going, especially since Final Fantasy 15 was already edging towards that, and it felt like uh, Ignis and Gladios was kind of like a hold over from when it was back versus 13 more than really a significant part of combat. So I feel like this is kind of the the next step forward and it'll probably be, I think it'll be fun. It looks really good. Bailey, you had, you had an immediate thought as soon as you saw the combat UI. Would you like to share with us your, your moment of great triumph here? Because you called your shot. And... The main director worked <laughs> on... So the, the main director for 16... Wait, let me see this guy's name. Um, I fucking... Me and Azari were like, holy shit. So the main director for 16 is Hiroshi Takai. Um, and he worked on... So he was the main director for a really underrated Square game called The Last Remnant. Mm -hmm. um, and the UI for 16 is like heavily inspired from this, which is really fucking funny because no one likes The Last Remnant. No. Um, and that's partly because of the state that it launched in originally. Yeah. So The Last Remnant <laughs> was originally an Xbox 360 exclusive. Yeah. Shipped on two discs. I own it. Um, shipped on two DVDs. And it runs in full on fucking slideshow mode on the Xbox 360. Like, this game is painful to attempt to play in its original form. It eventually got a Steam release and it eventually got a, a remaster uh, okay. on, on the PS4 when Square was like having some fun porting their, their uh, seventh gen games forward to eighth generation. Mm -hmm. um, so it's much better now, but when it originally released, it was almost unplayable in addition to it being extremely weird <laughs> it's it's yeah. like the i think it's like nexus saga i think is like the weirdest rpg square has made it's like mm -hmm. it's like really fucking out there it's like a combination of final fantasy and langrister or or mm. or yigdra union or something like uh, that in, okay. in combat uh because you're very much like fighting over like, oh, this side has the advantage right now. They have to push or this side is on the defensive and they have to turn the situation. Like this was, this was during a really experimental phase for Square because this was also around the time when uh, Final Fantasy 13 came out and that was radically different from anything that we'd seen before. Yeah. And this came after Final Fantasy 12, which was also radically different from anything that we had seen before. Um, so... This was this was the time that Square was like, "Hey, I've got a weird idea for a combat system. Let's make a whole game around it." Mm -hmm. um, and of course, you know, it joins uh, a, a strange list of of Xbox 360 uh, exclusive RPGs, a thing that probably should not have happened. Uh, it's and it's next to uh, Blue Dragon, uh, which a lot of people love. Um, Oh God! What's the one that Mist Walker made? Help me, help me. Uh, uh, the one where the protagonist is immortal. 
It's escaping me. It's escaping me. Yeah, I think I know what you're talking about. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Lost Odyssey. Oh, oh, yeah, Lost Odyssey. Odyssey. Yeah. Also yeah. very beloved. Uh, and Infinite Undiscovery, which is not very beloved. <laughs> 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 and everyone made fun of it. Uh, and Ooh. and uh, this is a weird time for Square that, that kind of still is echoing into today because obviously every new Final Fantasy game has massively shaken up the formula and this one looks like the biggest one yet because they brought in the Devil May Cry 5 guy. <laughs> yeah. To be clear, no knock against that. Devil May Cry 5 feels incredible to play. I'm really happy for all the people that, that are really excited about this. Uh, I am too. I'm looking forward to something unlike any Final Fantasy game that I have played before. Mm -hmm. um, just, just, just manage it well this time. Just, just give us, just give us the, the complete story. <laughs> don't, don't promise me two seasons of DLC that that doesn't happen because you lost a hundred million dollars on it. Because <laughs> that was embarrassing. Yeah. Uh any thoughts on 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 uh, our our extremely hot icons? I, I swear that that every time Yoshi P redoes the summons again, he's like, "Make them hotter, make them more fuckable." <laughs> yeah, and now they're attractive people that turn into attractive summon creature. <laughs> yeah, well, what stood out to me is that for sure Shiva looks like a more advanced version of the Final Fantasy fourteen Shiva. Um. But I mean, oh, I like it. I mean, I'm I'm just hoping everything will be, you know, good. There's, I think that there's a lot left to really see for this game because this was very much focused on gameplay. We still don't know a whole lot about the tone so like, of the story. The the, I'm not sure if they're like doing the like the fucking like um, Stumper. Like I'm like I'm not sure if they're doing the marketing for sixteen too well so far because like there's a lot of info on that website that they just don't ever talk about in any of these like trailers they've had so far. Like there's like a mm. lot of lore on there. Oh really? There's a lot of like they talk about like all of like the realms of like the world there. Oh shit. Um, like a lot of like the names, just like a lot, like like there's like a lot of stuff on there. But mm -hmm. like at the same time, I feel like you don't necessarily want to dump all of this into a big trailer that gets pushed at a major event because then it's like the well, the, yeah. the, the best comparison that I can make is um, if I don't I don't I don't know if Bailey would remember this, but Nate might when the the Maze Runner movie was coming out and um... the marketing for it. Uh, they were, you know, the characters were just talking in weird made up buzzwords in every single sentence. And it just was so incredibly cringe because they were speaking like it, they were speaking in tongues and weird proper nouns that real people don't say all the time. And it turned mm -hmm. a lot of people off. Um, so I feel like dumping lore and stuff like that in trailers that get pushed at these big events maybe isn't the best idea. Maybe mm -hmm. they'll work them into something that like they can throw together out of completed parts of the game as yeah. we get closer to release because like they're at a they're you know we're still about a year out from release they're at a point where making trailers involves them like potentially still making content whole cloth for the trailer that then has yeah. to get repurposed for the game once yeah. you're the other way around and you have like finished cutscenes and shit that you can edit into a trailer I think that that's much easier to like have stuff come out at a faster pace. And I think that's why we see that we've seen that approach with uh, both of the most recent Shin Megami Tensei releases where SMT five got to the point where they could make a trailer every day about an enemy because that team wasn't doing anything anymore. And mm -hmm. you know, all the visuals were already done for it. And now we're seeing the same thing with soul hackers too. Um, so I'm hopeful that, that more of this stuff and more of the world gets into uh, future marketing material. This this trailer was just meant for hype, yeah. And I don't blame them for doing that because that was what that's what I think more people really desperately wanted first. Yeah. Like you want to be able to get excited based on a thing that you'll be able to do in the game, mm -hmm. less so about you know the world that you're doing it in because we've seen you know we've seen big huge really detailed worlds that are still really boring <laughs> so you you want you want to make sure that this is something that's going to be exciting first and foremost yeah 
Uh, before we wrap up uh, the first half, either of you have any closing thoughts on FF16? Uh, FF16, um, I think, was a good idea to release this big bombastic trailer as well as, hey, we're doing it to 2023 to kind of be like, hey, it's excitement and we're just doing polishing now and, you know, stuff like that. So I think it'll it'll be good. And good. We want polish because polish was something that the original release of Final Fantasy 15 did not have in in as many uh, as much quantity as it needed to. <laughs> yeah, Bailey, how about you? Um, I I think it was um, so like I I think it was like a few like months ago when Yoshi P said that he wanted 16 to be a game for like veteran fans to like get back in the series to like feel their passion again with it. Um. And I, I like really hope that's what it does because I feel like since like excluding like 14, like the last mainline game that was like widely loved was probably 10, maybe. Mm-hmm. I can agree with that. Yeah, um, I feel like 10, yeah. Because so, both 13 and 15 were pretty controversial. So and, and like nobody like fucking cared about 12. So this is I I I do hope this does well just like overall because i feel like it's been a, like way too long since there's been like a non-divisive mainline final fantasy game you know mm-hmm. we can only hope <laughs> that they that they i mean if there's any team that i trust to get this right on the first try it is this team because this is the team you know this is the creative team that fixed the disaster that was final fantasy 14 1.0 mm-hmm. so they can if they can pull that off i think that i think that we're in good hands um and with that we're going to wrap up the first half of this episode we're going to take a quick break and when we come back we're going to discuss some recent news about uh some uh successes and unfortunate embarrassing uh failures that we've seen in several companies in uh the nerdosphere in terms of treating their workers correctly uh we're, we're gonna go there so we'll be right back see you in a minute Welcome back, everyone. So in the first half of this episode, uh, we kind of got really hype over a bunch of games that were announced at the state of play. And in the second half of this episode, we're going to be talking about some bullshit. Um, So in case y'all haven't seen yet, uh, this is we're veering off of video games uh, and towards just the broader nerdosphere. But um, so Seven Seas is a is a uh, manga localization company uh, that for a while has been mostly freelancers, but has about 40 uh, full-time employees, basically all of whom are paid less than what should be the industry standard. Uh, And as basically any group of people that are experiencing this uh, should do at this point, they Mm -hmm. decided to go ahead and form a union so that they could bargain for uh, basically the means to do their jobs better and be paid a living wage. Um, So this happened on May 23rd, which is the date we're going to come back to because something else happened on May 23rd. Uh, They uh, publicly announced that they had uh, invoked the right to form a union. Uh, The union has a Twitter account. If you want to follow any of this, it's at underscore UW7S, uh, United Workers of Seven Seas. And a couple days later, they got uh, they got the news and shared it that Seven Seas had decided not to voluntarily recognize this union. Um, so that means that basically they have to go through the process of having an official formal union election through the National Labor Relations Board, um, where all of the people that would be uh, eligible to join the union have to vote on whether or not they want to make one. And if there's a supermajority, then... Uh, they are legally recognized and the company then has to uh, recognize the union and begin bargaining. Um, So Seven Seas doesn't recognize their union. And then towards the end of last week, Seven Seas hired a union busting law firm to try and shut the whole thing down. Um, So... Have uh, Nate? Have you ever worked a job uh, with with union busting going on? Because I certainly have. Um, not actively, but I I have worked a job where you well no actually I have 
Walmart. I worked mm-hmm. at Walmart where there is a whole training section, training video about how not to give out your signature, how not to sign anything. And it feels like this feels really weirdly anti-union. Um, and that's because it is. Um, um, I had that experience working at Staples. Uh, it was my first job when I was 18. And they, again, had a whole video about like unions uh, collect more money from you than they will ever uh, get you paid. And they're only in it for the people that run the union. And it's never a good idea. And it interferes with our ability to have direct conversations with you. This is all bullshit, by the way. Mm-hmm. This is the um, any company that says they have an open door policy. I'm not going to sugarcoat it. That's bullshit. Um, yeah. That is that is a company that is going to actively try to stop you from unionizing. And I've seen that working for other companies too. I just can't legally say uh, at the moment because reasons. Um, but Staples was a long time ago, and yeah, I can I can pretty confidently say that a lot of that was going on there um, yeah. because we were being paid minimum wage. Yeah. And it's. It's really shitty because this is not the first time that we have seen a company elect to hire a law firm to bust the union before it happens rather than just there's always money for union busting is is what I'm getting at here. There's not there's never money to pay your to pay your employees, but apparently there's just always room in the budget to hire a legal team to come in and stop the whole thing from happening. Yeah. Capitalism. Um So as of this week, um, I believe that they are holding an official union election. I believe that they, that they succeeded in that. If I uh, remember correctly, Uh, I'm double checking now because the last thing I want to do is have to issue more corrections like I did for last week. Uh, If you guys didn't see that, I'm very sorry. I was misinformed on uh, the crypto application in, Mm -hmm. uh, in Nino Kuni Cross Worlds because I didn't play far enough to to have it shoved in my face. Yeah. Um, but anyway, this is currently a work in progress. This is early days, but it is really embarrassing for Seven Seas. And uh, thankfully, I double checked with Azario because obviously we partner with companies that that publish manga in the United States to do our manga reviews. Thank you, Don Cho, um, who who you know oversees a lot of that. Um, he said this was fine to talk about. Uh, so seven C's do better uh, <laughs> is is the easiest thing that I can say um, because this. Uh, so I mentioned I mentioned May twenty third uh, as an important day uh, because on on the other side of things, May twenty third is the day that the Quality Assurance Union at Raven Software. Uh, won their union election and are now legally forced to be recognized. So this yes. situation started last year when the entire Activision Blizzard thing was was first gaining steam. Um, and Activision Blizzard basically said, no, you can't have a union that's just for the QA people. You have to have the entire studio recognize a union because they're trying to obviously make it as hard as possible to make this whole thing happen. Yeah. Um, and the uh, NLRB said, no, they don't have to. That's stupid um, because other industries that are unionized have very individual unions. You look at the film yep. industry, uh, actors have their own union. All of the different crew positions, almost all of them have their own union. Um, so there's, it's, it's very foolish to say that <laughs> a company has to be entirely unionized or not at all. Um, yeah. So that's unfortunate, but um, Activision also engaged in a bunch of union busting of its own. They fired a bunch of people uh, that were pro-union and hired a bunch that, uh, you know, they could they could give as much union uh, uh, anti-union training to as possible. Like we mentioned before, these companies love to love to you know tell you that it's all lies and that they have your best interests at heart just just on their own. Um, and that's never true. That's never true under capitalism. Never, ever, ever corporations don't have your best interests at heart because they are not, it is not in their best interests to have your best interests at heart. (laughs) Not how, it's not how the economy works. 
Um, and obviously this comes uh, at the same time as a massive push for unionization in a lot of other parts of, of America are coming. Uh, very famously, we've had, I think, three now Starbuckses uh, officially officially unionized and, and yeah. be forced to be recognized by the company. Oh, that's very cool. Um, but Bailey, do you have do you have any thoughts on like what the what this might turn out to be or or any hopes for how the seven seas thing might go? Because obviously there's implications either way. I mean, I do hope it works out. Like it's so like I um I think the hardest step is is for that first union to go through, you know, like the first recognition to go through and then after that they'll hopefully spur on further action you know mm -hmm. so but it kind of just all depends on how this one works out yeah there's like we also saw uh several amazon warehouses make attempts at unionization and amazon is engaged in even or appears to be uh <laughs> it is allegedly <laughs> uh, engaged in even shadier shit uh, where it almost like it looks like they're trying to rig the union elections and and like make it as hard for people to accurately count the votes as possible yeah. um, to the point where like there are recounts being demanded in several of these. Uh, so unfortunately, it is it is just it is going to be a fight against a lot of these bigger corporations, and it is really obvious in basically all of these situations that in terms of PR, it is in these companies' best interest to just agree, to just yeah. do it. Because getting getting that up front is the only way that this, that this happens without the company getting egg all over their faces and trending on Twitter uh, for, for being shitty to their workers in an age where it is really hard like it is both really hard to find like a decent job that takes advantage of your skill set and it's also really hard to find you know decent pay at all yeah and where we are in the industry with inflation especially is everyone needs to be being paid more than they are uh, in in game development, in manga localization, in anime localization. Uh, mm -hmm. I am I am still very much hoping that uh, the the Crunchyroll translators manage to band together and unionize, despite the fact that they're all in different places. That that is something that I've been really wanting to happen for a while because they are infamously underpaid. Um, but one example that we do have of this working out uh is one that i'm going to reach a little farther from this isn't really within the noisy pixel purview but it's uh of personal interest to me um so the company paizo i'm going to give a quick history this is a company that used to make uh materials for dungeons and dragons third edition like official materials with wizards of the coast um uh they wrote the the dragon magazine back when that was a thing and they they uh, created all kinds of, of, of adventure material. And then once uh, D&D 4th edition came out, they officially cr uh, effectively created a fork of 3.5 edition called Pathfinder uh, that quickly became the second biggest uh, D20 tabletop RPG system out there um, because it, you know, everybody didn't like D&D 4th edition, but a lot of people were still playing it just because it was it still had the words Dungeons and Dragons on it, and that's recognizable. Yeah. Um, and since the success of D&D 5th edition, they've released a second revised edition of Pathfinder that, that kind of takes like the best of what they had and the best of what Dungeons and Dragons does and mixes it together into a system that flows a lot more elegantly. Um, but while all of this was happening, apparently their office has been horribly mismanaged. Um, like, and by their office, I mean also the physical office because no one was was hiring anyone to clean carpets for literally oh, no. years. <laughs> what? Literally years. Wow. That's what happened. Like oh. employees in the office started complaining about the smell. Ooh. That's how bad this got. Ooh. Um, in addition, a lot of uh, artists were being replaced with freelancers all over the place, and then the freelancers were being paid much less than the full time staff were. Yeah. Um, and the full time staff were already not being paid. Uh, really an industry standard. 
Yeah. Um, so a lot of bad, a lot of bad stuff was going on for a very long time before anybody really decided to do anything about it. Um, and a whole bunch of allegations came out about the management ability of Paizo's president. And at the same time, uh, a majority of the full-time staff came together to form the Paizo Workers Union. And within days, the union was officially recognized. They did not have to go through the process of uh, legal certification through the NLRB. They just immediately were like, "Yeah, okay, yeah, let's. We're we're just gonna we're just gonna do this. We're just gonna because they could tell that the PR disaster was was you know only gonna come out worse if they had a president who was facing allegations of harassment, discrimination, and mismanagement, mm -hmm. uh, and they were actively fighting against a union. Um, and you know, there's there's even more stories about the president uh, doing doing really shitty things." Uh, especially concerning the the outwardly inclusive mission statement of the company and what's printed in all the books versus how the company was actually acting internally yeah. uh, in terms of rooming at events where they would place trans employees in different rooms from cis employees. Wow. Yeah. Um, but I, I was panicking when when the entire you know when the allegations first dropped and when uh the news about the union first dropped because it wasn't immediate because it's never immediate you know any any company that's of that size and scale has to have you know discussions with the with the higher ups about it yeah. um and i was like oh my god am i going to have to like stop supporting this system that i've been playing for almost a decade uh and no, because the union did, did not call for a boycott and they were recognized almost immediately by the company. They are still in the bargaining phase. The company just got a new president recently, which, yeah. good. Um, <laughs> bargaining takes a while, uh, especially if you're not going to you know, go on strike and it has to happen while people are still working and doing their jobs. Yeah. But this is the right way to do it. This is, this is the way that doesn't lead to a strike having to happen. Uh, and we have seen strikes already happening uh, as this entire push has been happening. So, yeah. <laughs> Nate, any any uh, recent stories about this that you want to share that you've seen? Um, so you, you've talked about all the major ones, like the Starbucks, because that was the one that kind of came to mind right away. Um, and then, of course, Amazon. Uh, so nothing comes straight to mind, but it, it is always a good thing. And, I, and I'll just say to, re, to go, kind of go back to basically the Raven uh, one. I'm really happy the QA one is going to, it is going to, or has um, been uh, recognized because uh, quality assurance, you know, teams have been notoriously crapped on by, you know, developers they're the first people to get laid off when the yep. project's done every time yep and, and they're the most and they're arguably one of the most important because you know that they play test games to infinity and make sure everything's all right and from what i understand companies actively tell their developers to hate qa yeah and that's a hard job like yeah. for for anybody that you know grew up with like the the digipen commercials or the the for-profit college commercials where, where they were literally like do you want to play video games for a living that's not really what it's like like yeah. this is this is a position where you have to go over a game with a fine-toothed comb and your goal is not to finish it or have fun it is to like test it as many ways as you possibly can to make sure things aren't going to break and yeah if you have an understaffed QA department or a department that isn't given enough time, bad things happen to your game. Yep. Uh, and Sonic 06 things happen to your game. <laughs> cyberpunk things happen to your game. And, and well, no one was given enough time for cyberpunk. <laughs> <laughs> no, no one, nobody, but you know, and I just hope it, it comes across to that now, you know, other other QAs, Q and A testers will do it, and now hopefully developers will start doing it because, you know, a multi billion dollar industry. There's no reason for workers to have to sleep in the office or or subsist after off of ramen or, you know, not be able to pay their fucking bills or see their family. Yeah, exactly. 
Bailey, any any thoughts or ideas here? <laughs> and pretty much what you guys all said. Like, I I think it's kind of fucking ridiculous how bad the QA is treated. It's truly but cringe. I, what, yeah, I feel like they're kind of like the like they're kind of almost like the backbone of what we get, you know. And like the fact that they don't get respect is pretty fucked up. So hopefully this serves to better represent them in the future, you know. I just I want this to open the floodgates. Like yeah. I want the rest of Raven software to be unionized. I want, you know, everybody working on Call of Duty to to start looking at this. I want because like these video games make these executives stupid amounts of money. And yeah. all of these presidents, you know, Bobby Kotick, Strauss Zelnick, uh Randy Pitchford now <laughs> now that now that Gearbox uh now that he's president of the, of Gearbox's parent company, like none of these people are doing the work to be paid as much as they are being paid. And all of that money is gi being given to them at the expense of their workers having a healthy work-life balance and the ability to make a living wage based yeah. on all of what they had to do to get to the point that they're at because you know a lot of these positions you look at them and they're in like a lot of the the paychecks might seem attractive but a lot of these people have to do a lot to get here you have all you know all the student loans that have to be paid for all the years that you had to go to school to get these certifications and to have all of these degrees that these companies are asking for for entry level positions yeah and then they're also asking for five years of experience for an entry level position <laughs> yeah um because i i being um inside the industry is one of my dreams. Uh, I looked at it. There's there's so many positions that already want you to have experience working on a shipped game. And like, there's just, it, it takes so much to make so little in this industry. Yeah. And I think that, yes, the games are expensive to make. The staff, is, the staffs are growing. That is only all the more reason that we need to see an even bigger push you know, a massive wave of this happening throughout the industry. And I've, yeah. I have uh, a friend that, that works in game dev and he has for about a decade. Uh, I don't believe that he listens, but he's kind of pushed back on the idea that the game industry needs to unionize because of, you know, the way that the film industry unions look, but at the same time, like those movies get made. Yeah. All of these people do are able to work together. And I think that, sacrificing your employees health and well-being and mental stability for the sake of the pipeline is not worth it mm -hmm. like the world is fucking ending we already have enough stress to deal with without our, our our job adding piles and piles and piles of that yeah and you know what i i bring this up a lot because it's a thing that's been on my mind since I played it, but like the, the, the cyberpunk 2077 that I played is the version that should have like that released when the game should have originally come out in, yeah. in March of this year. And I think about the horrific experiences that, that uh, CD project red developers went through after the developer was like, we're not going to crunch. We're not going to crunch at all. Everyone's going to have a healthy work-life balance. And then, you know, the news came down. Oh, well, actually, they're working on Saturdays for the next six weeks. And it turned out that they had been crunching for months and the company had been lying about it. Yeah. So this is just the stuff that makes it out to us. These horrific stories about people getting burnt out and working 80 hours a week. This is just the stuff that we see. Yeah. God only knows how much worse it is on the inside and unions can only make things better for the employees on the ground yep so more more of this please because yep. i want to see i want to see seven c's uh back off and accept this uh i want to see the the union busting law firms uh get held accountable because it's insane to me that union busting is technically illegal in the united states and yet this company is public is very publicly well known as a union busting law firm, and they just get to do that, yeah. And no one gets punished for it. Um, and I hate, I hate that there's always room in the budget for union busting is a true statement that I had to think of because it's really depressing that that is where we live. Yep. 
any final thoughts from either of you guys? I know I've been talking a lot. This is like an issue that's like really close to me. Um, and it's also really close to me because like I said, the whole reason why I never got into game development was, you know, some of it was my own like insecurities of maybe I'm not good enough, but a lot of it was after hearing about what you have to do to even get your foot into the door and how much of it is primarily luck. And then even when I'm in, you know, I would basically be working as like in one year as if I had worked for five years and, and I decided to not do it and go for a safer bet. You know, so I, I'm really hoping this this starts going through, and I, I really want it to. I, I really, really want it to. I, I want to make my dream to get into the industry a reality. And the current state of it is, is I would literally die <laughs> before I do anything. Bailey, how about you? Yeah, like pretty much just like I I I find it kind of sad how like how how cool the idea of being in the industry is like when you're like really young and then that illusion like shatters the more you grow up and the more you learn about how the reality really is you know yeah. and like i i think part of the dream of this scenario like if this all like works out and grows is for that illusion that kids have to actually be like really no so mm -hmm. yeah it's it's very similar to like the kids that grew up watching cartoons and anime and thinking oh i want to move to japan i want to work on anime and then you find out that the people that make anime are are not able to live off of that like no. it it's really disheartening that this thing that that you know creates things that make people happy the people that make those things aren't happy and like to be clear i know that people you know might want to work overtime uh and might not care as much that they're working you know every weekend and i'm not saying that that has to go away but i'm saying that that can't be compulsive that mm -hmm. we need to see an end to companies you know even even mildly uh or implying that they're going to retaliate against people that say that they don't want to, because there's a lot of companies that'll say, oh, you don't have to if you don't want to, but that also comes with the asterisk of, but we're not gonna consider promoting you uh, and your job is gonna go nowhere and we're gonna uh, li list you as being unmotivated and uncommitted to your job and lay you off uh, You know, as soon as the first the first round of layoffs comes around. I want that to stop. I want, yeah. I want People who who want the option to stay late to be paid for that. And I want them to like even if it takes mandatory uh vacation days after after deadlines are hit to to make sure that these people are are staying healthy. Like if that's where we have to go with this, that's where we have to go with this because yeah. the way that this industry works now doesn't frankly <laughs> no it, it doesn't and a long way will be with mandatory timelines of how long each feature is going to be implemented and to be mm -hmm. more realistic because like it it it's astounding to me that two decades after the ea wives thing we're still doing this mm -hmm. um quick quick background on that uh, uh uh there was basically a uh community formed around uh, the wives of uh, employee, male employees that were working at EA on, on Madden games back in the early 2000s who were publicly complaining against the company that they never got to see their partners and that they were always being burnt out and always working every weekend. And we're still here. We are still here two years later. Yep. And I want I want unionization because I want collective bargaining to be able to make that a choice and a choice that people don't feel compelled into. Yeah. And that's where we are on that. So that was heavy. I'm sorry. Uh, it was, it was kind of just going to be that way, but thank you guys for uh, having that discussion with me and helping us get that out into the world. Um, and I want to thank you guys at home for listening to another episode of the Stray Pixels podcast. I know that this one uh, was a bit of a roller coaster. Um, so thank you for sticking it out if you were here this long. And I hope that, that you know, I don't, I don't see a lot of uh, 
disagreement in the comments, but y'all have been lovely with that so far. So I'm hoping, I'm hoping that we get the reception that we usually do. Uh, so anyway, we post every Tuesday on your podcast app of choice and on the noisy pixel YouTube channel, ideally. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, it, we had it, we had a community guideline strike last week. Uh, so you guys didn't even get to see Ryuji's glorious VTuber. Uh, we'll, we'll have him back on soon so that he gets his moment. Um, what do you guys think of the unionization situation? Were there any that we missed that you wanted us to talk about? Uh, is there any company in particular that you want to see get unionized that we didn't mention? Uh, let us know in the comments on YouTube. If there's anything you'd like us to talk about in a future episode, you can leave a comment under this video, or you can talk to us on Twitter. You can find me, Colin, at, at the Arcane Ranger, Nate at, at less than Nathan, and Bailey at, at Orpheus Joshua, or the site itself at, at Noisy Pixel News. Uh, the Stray Pixels podcast is brought to you by NoisyPixel.net. Noisy Pixel is run by a group of gamers who work hard to bring you the latest news, reviews, previews, podcasts, and more. Please like, subscribe, and follow to keep up with our future content, and we will see you guys next week.